I really enjoyed your interview with Cliff Richard, um, which I listened to recently. Um, he, he's a great you're, man. You're far too young. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the old and, and, and the new, but uh, I wanted to start by asking you um, about the coronavirus vaccine and lockdown too. Um, so both separately, I guess, you know, how hopeful are you with regards to the coronavirus um, vaccine? Do, do you think this is this means life is going to go back to normal by spring, as some optimists have been saying? Or do you think we should tread very carefully and be very cautious with how optimistic we get? I'm not sure life is going to go back to normal in any time soon, certainly not by spring, because it's great news that they've discovered a vaccine. It's even better news that it seems to be 90 percent uh, effective. So that on its on its own is, is a great development in this, but it will take a long time to roll out. And obviously they're prioritizing uh, different groups who are most vulnerable, understandably so. But I don't think uh, we can sit here and say that, well, by March next year, everything will be back to normal. I don't think we're going to be able to go back to football grounds until uh, August next year. Um, but th this is... The, the first bit of light that we've seen um, in, in this whole saga. So from that point of view, it's obviously very welcome. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to, to agree with you that we're not going to see things like football games and live concerts coming back into public life for a while. I mean, do you think even saying August next year might be a, be a tad optimistic? Well, it could be. We just don't know how this virus is going to develop. It could mutate into something very, very different. It's very difficult to predict at the moment. That's why I think um, whatever you think of the government's performance on this so far, you've got to kind of have a little bit of sympathy with them in that they are trying to make decisions looking six months ahead, and it's almost impossible to do at the moment. Um, that They did predict a second wave in the, in the autumn, and people say, well, if they predicted the second wave, why, why didn't they make sure that they took measures to make sure it didn't happen well no government frankly in, in Europe has managed to do that you could say that some in Asia have but that they, they are used to dealing with um, uh, things like this in a way that we're not they they already had their test and trace system set up uh, that they, they were used to wearing face masks we've had to start this from a standing start and yes huge mistakes have been made all, all along the way um, but um, in this second wave, you look at our situation compared with Belgium, Holland, France as well, Spain. And although we are, well, I don't think we've reached the peak of the second wave yet, we haven't quite got the number of cases or deaths or hos hospitalizations that one or two other countries have. Now, that's no great cause for celebration. You can't, you can't say, well, we've done well with 500 people dead uh, yesterday, the, the highest since May. But um, you could argue without some of the measures that have been taken, it would have been a whole lot worse. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. So, so are you of the view that Boris and, and the government have handled this just about OK? Um, or, or do you have criticisms of the way that they've dealt with it? Uh, I, I think OK would be pushing it. I think they have made too many mistakes along the way. Some of them, you can only identify those mistakes with hindsight. That is true. Um, for example, um, the test and trace, they abandoned that right at the beginning and really didn't restart it until the beginning of May. That proved to be a mistake. Now, the politicians, I assume, did this on advice from the medical profession and the scientists because they could only do 2,000. They thought, well, what's the point? We can't expand this quickly enough. In retrospect, I think that was a bad decision. Again, if you look back to the meetings of SAGE, I think on the 17th of March, they were not recommending lockdown then. So was Boris Johnson really supposed to lock down the country against the advice of the medical professionals at that time? Um, in retrospect, I wish he had, because I think we did go into lockdown a week, 10 days too late. There, there were super spreader events like uh, the Cheltenham Festival, uh, the, the Liverpool match against Atletico Madrid, which I think it was, I remember thinking at the time, why are these things being allowed to go ahead? Uh, they shouldn't have been. That is quite clear now. But it, again, it's with hindsight. But we can all we can all judge things in hindsight and think, well, why didn't they do that? It was so obvious. Well, maybe it wasn't so obvious at the time, and maybe the advice that they were getting at the time wasn't so unequivocal as as people now like to make out. Yeah, I, I think I really agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, it's pretty clear. Anyone 
who says, you know, we should have locked down way earlier. I mean, I see this all over the media and I don't really remember at that stage in March and I'm no supporter of Boris, by the way, um, but I don't remember this huge like clamoring in the media saying like, we must lock down, we must lock down. I don't remember loads of op-eds coming out in, in you know, The Guardian and all yeah. over the BBC and stuff saying we must lock down. But well, there I've were there were people. Like there there were, to be fair, there were people saying yeah. that. I don't remember a great clamour, but there were people saying, "Well, yeah, there would have um, been other countries some people, have already done it." There would have been some people, but the way it, um, the way it's um, being kind of described now, it was like everybody was asking them to lock down, and they were kind of like refusing. It, it was much more. Um, people were of very different opinions. I, I think looking back, and I, yeah, I'm definitely no supporter of Boris, and he probably should have locked down earlier but why is it that um we've got this great focus during the midst of a pandemic um on kind of weeping over the past weeping over spilt milk as it were um as opposed to trying to come together do you think we've managed to establish any sort of unity as a result of the pandemic i mean i think at the beginning there was a bit of a community spirit but that seems to have uh waned somewhat since the early well, the, 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 the reason you have this constant criticism is because we have a 24-hour news re news media uh, we we have news channels that have to fill their space and the easiest way to fill space is to get someone to come on and slag off the government um <laughs> and that's really <coughs> excuse me that that is what is what's happened newspapers have huge amounts of space to fill from people i mean it's not it's not really very interesting for someone to write an article saying oh, yes, the government's done really well here what a great government we have that nobody yeah. wants to read that uh, and i do think that social media has amplified this to a, a huge extent as well um you see behind me i've got the, the book that i brought out in may why can't we all just get along there's a lot in that book about this sort of subject about how the media um and particularly social media uh, just um exaggerates everything makes a bad situation far worse and if you believe everything you read on twitter i mean for example back in at the December general election, by 5 p.m. on election day, Twitter had convinced me that Jeremy Corbyn was heading for a majority. Um, social media is not real life. It does not reflect the views of normal people. And, and the election result showed that. Uh, and you see this time and time again, that we're told that we have the most incompetent government in history. Now, as I say, like you, I'm, I'm, I've never been a fan of Boris Johnson, but you look at the opinion polls at the moment, and yes, Labour have gone ahead in a couple of them, but if this government was seen as so incompetent, do, do you not think that Labour would be 20 points ahead by now? Because in, in any normal period, with the level of criticism that they've had, that's exactly what would be happening. Now, that may say something about the unpopularity of the Labour Party, um, but I would have expected them... And if I think back to crises that the Thatcher government and the major government faced, um, Tony Blair was 50 points ahead in one opinion poll at, at one point against John Major. Well, th that isn't being reflected now. I think there is a certain coming together in the country, so we are all in this together. Um, you're right, that was more evident at the beginning of the pandemic than possibly now. Um, but there, there is still, I think, that uh, spirit that uh that the, the country has got to get through this together even though i think quite a lot of people have got a bit tired of it all now and you you look at this second lockdown in england at the moment and there is a lot of evidence that a lot of people are just ignoring it you look at the levels of traffic on the roads and i'm sorry this is not lockdown like it was before so are there lots of people out and about in London then, you know, um, what are people doing? Are they just going out and about and walking, well, and visiting each other? I mean, I, well, a friend of mine who lives in London, he said he's in a shared house and um, one of the other people in the house had three different people around last night. Well, that's not allowed in this situation. I said, well, you should go and tell them. Um, he's oh no I can't and that's the problem that we all don't want to get involved in an argument. So if we're on the tube and someone isn't wearing a face mask, do we approach them? generally not because sometimes it doesn't end very well um in, in the end you know that this virus will only go away if we as individuals help make it go away if we continue to flout the social distancing rules if we continue to flout the lockdown rules it will be around for a lot longer than it might otherwise would have but some people just don't seem to get that i'm afraid you look at some of the scenes on the day before lockdown in liverpool in newcastle where there were parties in the street 
um, totally irresponsible. But you, you say that and you just seem like a grouch or a very sort of grumpy person. But in the end, um, those who obey the rules are less likely to get it or indeed transmit it to other people. And that message still doesn't seem to have got home to some people. Yeah, but I mean, there is the, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of validity in what you said, of course, but are you suggesting that we're going to be able to get it down to zero COVID? I'm, I'm having somebody on my show who's kind of um, putting forth a, an argument that we really should go into like a militarized lockdown and, and that we should get to, to zero COVID. Do you think it's, do you think that's not going to be impossible though? Um, do, do you think that in a way these measures are sort of just a stopgap till, till a vaccine and, and that we may just have to learn to live with it? Of course, by learning to live with it, we probably will have to just keep face masks on and, and things like that. Or are you of the opinion that we could reach zero COVID if we were just a bit better behaved? Well, I think a militarised lockdown is going to one extreme. Um, on the other hand, I don't see the point in having a lockdown if it isn't a proper lockdown, yeah. uh, where people think that they can get away with whatever they want to do and they're just not going to obey the rules. Um, there's, if you don't have enforcement of rules, then that means that there will always be a proportion of people who aren't going to obey them, whether that's 1%, 5%, 10%. Um, I, I don't know what the cutoff point is. If it gets to more than 10%, I suspect it, it will have a very negative effect on the likelihood of getting the R rate down or the number of infections down. On the other hand, I don't want to live in a police state. Some people think that with, with the restrictions on our freedom at the moment, we are living in a quasi-military state, which I, I think is preposterous. Um, I'm not somebody who subscribes generally to an authoritarian point of view. I want the state to keep out of my life generally. But there are emergency occasions when the state has to intervene. Wartime is one of them. If I'd been an MP, I would have voted through all of these measures so far. They've all got sunset clauses on them. Um, should it go further? Probably. I think there should be mandatory wearing of face masks outside. The moment you set out Side your front door you should be wearing a face covering um, now that would be fairly easy to enforce but on the other hand we only have a certain amount of police officers to enforce these things and do we want to take them I rather like we've taken NHS staff off normal duties to deal with Covid do we then effectively say to criminals hey you, you've got free reign at the moment because um, all the police constables are going to be issuing on the spot fines for not wearing a face covering. These are decisions that governments have to take. They're not easy, and I don't envy them in this situation, but I, I don't believe this lockdown is anywhere near as severe as the first one. And therefore, I, I do worry that the R rate will not come down below one by the time it finishes on December the 2nd. And so you do you really think that face masks should be mandatory from the minute you step outside? Because I mean, yes. making a blanket rule like that I mean, I, like, I'm here in the middle of the countryside, for example, and like, if you were to put that as a, a legality, you know, technically, even though I'm in the middle of nowhere, you know, from the minute I step outside, I should put on a face mask. Do you, or do you think that we're incapable of a kind of working out the nuances of when a face mask is, is appropriate and not? You know, if it's, a cra if it's like Tottenham Court Road and it's crowded, loads of people put on a face mask. If you're in the middle of like, an empty field, take the opportunity to have some fresh air? Or do you think it just needs to be a blanket rule because we've thus far proven ourselves to be- I think part of the problem that we've had so far is a lot of these rules are incomprehensible to people. It's so complex and I think you have to have simple rules. And yes, you're right. If you're living in the middle of the countryside, like you are, like I am, you could argue, well, what, what's the point of that? Why, why create a rule that we don't really need? Well, it is because it's easily understandable. Uh, and just because you think, oh, I'm in the middle of the countryside, it, I can't catch it. Well, you could have had a Hermes driver deliver something to your front door five minutes ago. He breathes on the front door or around the area of the front door. You walk out a few minutes later and there will be some remnants of his breath in the air there, Prob possibly, probably. So, I mean, it's difficult to be categoric and say, well, just because you live in the middle of nowhere, you can't get it. There are, there are always exceptions to that rule. And I just think people like rules that uh, they can easily understand. Th this whole bubble thing, for example, do you understand that? Because I, I mean, I think I vaguely do now, but when, when, it, when the lockdown was announced, um, a friend of mine said, well, does that mean that I can have someone round? And I said, well, no, it doesn't. And then he looked on the government website and he said, well, I can have a, a, a bubble with somebody. 
And I just think this whole bubble thing is entirely incomprehensible to most people. I can't go and visit my elderly mother in a care home. That, there is something illogical about that. I think it, it's almost, it has to be much more easily understandable for people. Yeah, I mean, the, the bubble's one thing. I think business meetings are another thing. You know, what constitutes a business meeting? Is it people who might speculatively do business? I think there was a thing of Nigel Farage going to Boysdale with a bunch of people, you know, was he discussing business? Wasn't he? I'm just giving that as an example. <laughs> uh, it's just a bit like, you know, I could meet up with anyone and say it's a business meeting. And it's the same with the social bubble. And I almost get the impression that these rules are in place so that so that those kind of in the know about how hard government about how hard the law will come down on them can kind of just go about their business as normal whilst kind of keeping the majority of the public from mixing with each other to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, what was your opinion on, on the whole Dominic Cummings thing? I, mean, I really don't want to get bogged down too much with that because I, I, I thought that it was very bad what he did, but I thought the response personally was kind of psychotic, um, understandably in a way, but it, it, did, it did go to a sort of a real extreme. Um, but what was your well, opinion it, on that? It did because look, he, he is the... Um, <sighs> He is, the, he is the lightning rod for Boris Johnson at the moment. So if you can get a Dominic Cummings, you can get a Boris Johnson. Um, I, I, I thought what he did was really bad because the one thing the general public really don't like is for the ruling elites to say, well, don't do as I do, do as I say. And that was the message that was given out there, whether, whether he meant to do that or not. Um, now, in the wider scheme of things, um, driving to Barnard Castle... Um, okay, it wasn't the biggest crime of the century, but the, the message it sent out was, well, I'm, I'm above you lot, and I expect you to obey the rules, but um, I, I'm not going to. And, and I completely understand why. That, that was the moment, I think, that a lot of people just gave up on obeying the rules, and the message it sent out was absolutely terrible. Um, I thought he should have gone over it, to be honest. I thought either he should have quit or Boris Johnson should have sacked him. Whether it merited it or not, the message that it sent out was absolutely awful. And um, But he's still there. He is a very important part of the Johnson operation. Some would say the, the most important part. But no one ought to be indispensable. And, and in a way, the fact that he, he survived that uh, gave him a huge amount more power uh, the, it, because most most ordinary mortals would have fallen on their sword over that. Yeah, it was kind of odd how he didn't go, given how bad the crisis had got. But from my own point of view, having spoken to a lot of people about it, I feel like there was more anger over the whole situation. Yes, the public really don't like the elites behaving in that kind of way, breaking the rules as if they're above the rest of us. But from talking to, to, to normal people and, and to people who have different political views and things, pretty much everybody was kind of like, yeah, I feel like the media were more angry about it than we all are. Do you know, do you know what I mean to an extent? Well, I, I'm not sure that's right. I, I think that Did in you that, speak to a lot of in people that case, very angry. No, I, I mean, I can't remember on my phone-in show, I can't remember virtually anybody phoning in to defend Dominic Cummings. Oh, no, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm more saying that people were annoyed, but they weren't annoyed to the point where it, sh it, it should have been kind of dominating everyth everything in, in the news cycle for, for the length of time that it did. And kind of, the, I, I guess some people just didn't think it was a bigger deal. They were uh, as big a deal as it was made out to be. They were kind of more concerned with, with the actual situation with regards to coronavirus, not the kind of example being set by a member of Boris Johnson. Well, I don't, I don't remember speaking to a single person that took that view at all. I think really? most people were very, very angry about it. Uh, yeah, and understandably so. Um, it was more just what, what I gauged from the situation. And, you know, maybe I just spoke maybe, to maybe a lot of weird people. To, maybe you talked to different people than I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's... It's possible, and I definitely think there was a lot of outrage over it. And as I say, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't want to get bogged down with that because I feel like it has been spoken about. But it was one of the major events along the way. And so, do you, do you really think that since then we've stopped following the rules um, in part because of that, or do you think it's got to the got to the stage where the virus has been around for so long now that 
It almost feels like less of an urgent situation. There there were people who stopped following the rules because of that. Um, I think a survey showed that 7% of people did. Now, I think we are, are, what, four or five months on from that now. And I think the, the main reason that people possibly have stopped following the rules is just a certain sense of boredom or ennui, as as a French would say. People are just fed up. They want life to return to some degree of normality and they they just shrug their shoulders and think, well, um, I haven't got it so far. I don't see why I should get it in the future. So I'm just not going to do what I'm told to do. Well, look, we all have to make our individual decisions on this. I'm in the situation where I'm in a so-called vulnerable group being a type two diabetic. When the first lockdown happened, in fact, before the lockdown happened, I stopped going to London. I broadcast my radio show uh, from home and I did that for 90 programs. And I only went back into the studio at the end of July. Now, when the second lockdown happened, I thought, well, should I do the same? I didn't want to because, I I mean, I did enjoy it, actually. I actually rather enjoyed being at home for four months. And I literally didn't step foot outside the front door for four months. Um, I I think I went up to the local post office to deliver some parcels on occasions. But that was literally the only time I went out of the house between the, I think it was the 20, was it the 17th of March and the 25th of July? So when the second lockdown was announced, I had the decision to make. Now, the advice was not then for people to shield in the same way that it was on the first one. Um, But there was still part of me that thought, well, maybe I I shouldn't be going into London. But I thought, well, there's hardly anyone on the train going into London, so I'm not at risk in that way. At the other end, I don't have to get public transport. I walk for 10 minutes, probably less than that, to Leicester Square. My only risk is catching it from people at Global Radio. Now... Um, I've decided I would go in, but I mean, people can reasonably argue that I could work from home, therefore I should. But radio is considered an essential industry, so I can use that as a justification. But in the end, my decision is purely made on am I likely to catch it? Uh, And if I do, am I likely to pass it on to someone else? So my conclusion at that point was no, I'm not. So it does that not, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but is that not exactly the same as that face mask thing that we were discussing before, um, where you're, you're, you're looking at the nuances of the situation and making a judgment accordingly? Well, that's only because they haven't actually made it very clear. If they had said that, well, everyone must work at home and and people who are in vulnerable groups should be shielding now, that would have been my decision. I I would have made that, but but they haven't said that. So, but... So your opinion on face masks is, is that, we, that that should be made mandatory. Do you think people should be stricter on, on the work front or, or, or do you think that well, if, if, exceptions if, are kind if of fair been, enough? If it had been me making this, these decisions, um, I think I would have been stricter. I think I would yeah. have uh, tried to say to people, uh, you have to stay at home. If there, there can only be limited uh, exemptions from this. If you think back to the first lockdown, France was far stricter than us. Now, you could say, well, fact, a lot of good it did them, given that they're in a, now in a worse situation. Um, but they, people weren't allowed to go out of their houses. They had to print off a form, which they had to fill in and be, be able to show a police officer if they were asked for it. Now, I thought we should have done that in the first lockdown. Um, but I mean, then people say, oh, but not everyone's got a printer, not everyone's got the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So look, yeah. there is no perfect situation here. There is no, no government in the world. And people, people use New Zealand as an example, some of the Far East countries uh, as examples of what we should have done. You, you can't actually, if you're going to compare countries, you at least have to compare like with like. And you cannot in any shape or form compare a country which is in the middle of nowhere, which has got five million people with a a low density of population compared with a country like Britain. If you're going to compare us, compare us with France, compare us with Germany, compare us with Belgium or Holland, similar countries, similar population densities, similar economies. um, that, that, That is the only fair way to do it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, obviously, the, the countries in um, in Asia, you know, the likes of Vietnam, um, who had those great um, test and trace schemes, it, it's very enviable. We'd, we'd love to be in that situation, but I kind of agree with you. We should be comparing ourselves to countries um, closer to us. Um, th- thanks very much for for your insight on on all of that. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a whole debate that I suspect we're going to be um, having for 
yeah months years to come um i, I think you're right well because there will be an inquiry into this and that will no doubt uh throw up some very interesting things to debate yeah for sure um i want i want to i want to turn our attention now to, to to the u.s election um which again you know it it's going to be one for for the history books i mean i guess they all are but this one's been farcical to an extent that um i don't know some people were sort of predicting but it just seems like it's been ridiculous the, the whole thing um but um what, what are you most looking forward to uh, about a biden um presidency the last four years have been anything but normal. Um, I, I think Joe Biden was a very weak candidate to fight Donald Trump, um, for entirely the wrong candidate in many ways, but he did win. And there is no doubt that he won. Let, let's put that one to rest. And I think over the week since the election, he hasn't put a foot wrong. He's actually shown a side of him, which we didn't see in the election. He does seem to be in command. He seems to be lucid. He seems to be eloquent. He seems to be passionate. All the things that he wasn't doing the campaign. So I think he's made a good start. Yeah, I mean, it, it almost seems like... Um he's started his term already in, in, in the sense that we're hearing a lot a lot from him um it seems like coronavirus is going to be a big part um of how things are going to change um to what extent do you think things would have been different had the uh had the vaccine announcement come before the election there are some kind of ardent trump supporters claiming that this was all so conveniently timed but i kind of think that it wouldn't have changed anything um, the timing of it. I think Trump's rhetoric on coronavirus had already made um, the way he had handled it, you know, widely considered to be awful. I don't think the vaccine announcement would have changed anything, but what's your view on that? Well, to the extent that he would have claimed complete credit and almost made out that he had discovered it himself, um, you could argue that that might have swayed a few votes at the margins, but like you, I can't really see that. Um, it, it is it is a major achievement for Pfizer, which is overall an American company. Um, so Donald Trump would have ramped it up for all he was worth. Um, he's, he's accusing Pfizer of keeping it quiet until after the election. Um, well, we'll never know the truth of that. I, I, I would find that slightly difficult to believe, I have to say. Um, but even if, even if they did, I don't think it would have made a ma it wouldn't have made enough difference to have won the number of extra electoral college votes that he would have needed to get over the margin. Yeah, um, and. In terms of Biden changing the situation in America, um, what do you think he's going to be able to do? Because I've seen some people who um, did support Joe Biden. I've seen a couple of memes saying, um, you know, when you order Coke and you get Pepsi, the Coke in this situation being Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Pepsi that they've ended up with being Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. So I, I was wondering, to what extent do you think uh, Biden is going to be able to change things, you know, socially, politically? Well, I think he stands a much better chance than either of those two would have, because they, they're the equivalent of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, a Republican controlled Senate would have stood in his way on everything. Now, Biden's advantage here is that he's been a senator for God, God knows how long. He knows everyone on Capitol Hill. He gets on with a lot of the Republican sen senators. And there is a chance that he can persuade them to support some of his measures. But when we talk about reaching across the aisle, that aisle has got a hell of a lot wider over the last 10 or 15 years. Since the Tea Party took over the Republican Party, there have been fewer senators, particularly fewer congressmen in the House of Representatives, that will countenance any form of deal with a Democrat. So it's not going to be easy for Joe Biden, which makes this Senate race in Georgia, this runoff in January, incredibly important, because if the Democrats can win both of those seats, they're both held by the Republicans at the moment in Georgia, I think it will be 50-50, which will mean that Kamala Harris has the casting vote in the Senate as essentially the Speaker of the Senate. So um, that, that is going to be very interesting to watch. And it may be that next November, that the if the Republicans don't show any sign of wanting to do cross party deals, that the electorate revolt against that because of course we remember next November you have uh, the House of Representatives up for election again and you have a third of the Senate 
up for election. No, actually, no, the House of Representatives isn't. That's the following one. Um, but the, a third of the Senate will be up for re-election next November. And that is going to be absolutely crucial for Joe Biden. And, and what are his main, obviously he wants to deal with coronavirus differently um, to, to Trump. Um, he, he, you know, he wants to put in place a national mask mandate um, and he, he wants to take it a lot more seriously. But what are the other kind of key things that you think Biden will change? Well, I think the tone is going to be so different. I think that's what people are going to notice. But he's got to his main... Uh, Look, he's, he's not in power until January the 20th. So Trump has the ability to be a big disruptor between now and then. So who knows what he will have to take over. Um, we don't know where coronavirus will be in America by then. But his main focus, I suspect, has got to be on a national recovery plan uh, and how to get the American economy firing again, which from our point of view, we, we need them to do that because if the American economy isn't firing, the European economy doesn't fire so much as well. Um, I think that's going to be one of his main focuses next year. America has joined the international world again and um, will uh, cooperate with the international rules-based system in a way that Donald Trump hasn't. Um, he will rejoin the World Health Organization. So that there will be, this is not business as usual in America. It will take him time to reverse a lot of the things that Donald Trump did. The American government is like an oil tanker. It's very difficult to turn around. It will take time. Um, and, and I think the measure of his success will be in two years time, how, do, how different does America look from what it does now. Yesterday we saw Pom uh, Mike Pompeo say uh, quite shockingly, you know, I'm looking forward to a transition to a Trump second term. Now you've already kind of put to rest earlier in, in, in one of your um, answers, you know, Biden's won, no doubt about that. And I mean, that that is widely considered to be the, be the case um, amongst all but the most ardent Trump supporters. Um, however, why do you think M M Mike Pompeo is saying that? Do you think Trump's lawsuits are entirely speculative as they're being made out to be? Do you think any chaos is, is, is going to be on the horizon um, ahead of Biden's inauguration? Well, I think there is going to be chaos. Um, Pompeo said that because he can't really say anything else. If you are a member of the Trump administration, and the, um, as, uh, he is effectively the number of three, number four person in the administration, he either stands by Donald Trump or he doesn't. And if he doesn't, he gets the hell out of there. Uh, if he had said anything different to that, no doubt Donald Trump would have done to him what he did to Mike Asper, the defense secretary. So that didn't surprise me. You could tell, uh, I saw a video of Pompeo saying that, look, I've interviewed Mike Pompeo, I've met him. Um, he's actually quite a funny guy. He's got a waspish sense of humor. And I, if I'm being kind to him, I would say he was displaying that on that occasion. I, I think Donald Trump is putting all of his hopes on the Supreme Court. In theory, he's got a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court. But what I think he doesn't quite get is that the members of the Supreme Court are lawyers first and Republicans second. And I cannot see any of the, the, the six supposed Republican supporters on the Supreme Court, I can't see any of them buying the specious arguments that um, uh, that his press secretary put forward in, in that press conference yesterday. I just don't buy it, but uh, we will see. I mean, December the 8th is the important day. You just hope that even at that late stage, he can bring himself to do what any normal democratic politician would do and make a gracious concession. It will be too late, but better, better late than never. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really, really hope that he does kind of concede. That said, um, do you think that there's been this there's been this huge uh, push for him to concede um which you know perhaps he should have already done but uh, he he and many of his supporters do feel that there's some merit to these lawsuits perhaps there isn't perhaps they're going to be thrown out and he's going to ridicule himself even more than he already has done but given the fact it took al gore over a month to concede in that other race i know the situation was different um why is it that sort of since since Saturday, um, there's been this whole thing of Trump being being a sore loser? I mean, he probably is going to be a very sore loser. Um, but
but I, I, you know, I was only 10 when that Al, Al Gore thing happened. Was, was it the same type of thing back then? Was it like, you know, come on, Al Gore, concede? Um, or was the situation just completely different? I think it was different because that was just about one state and it, it, was a, it wasn't about electoral malpractice. It was about um, how many votes one candidate had got over another. It was about recounts and it was about whether votes were valid or not. Here, he's alleging effectively a, a conspiracy across the country or across several swing states um, all of which, apart from one, are controlled by Democrats. And he seems to forget that Georgia, which was one of the areas that he was complaining about, is controlled by the Republicans, that there's some conspiracy to pervert, pervert the election. Now, in a way, this is a really difficult one for the media to handle because, and I'm not sure the media have had their finest hour on this, where it's entirely, if a president wants to say something, um, it is, I think, the responsibility of the media to cover it, even if it is incendiary, even if it is wrong, even if the president tells a lie. But for the networks to pull out of press conferences, I think is a very dangerous precedent because they're essentially playing God in that situation. They're saying, look, we can't show the president because what he's saying, we believe you, th that might influence you in some way. Well, that, that, I, I wouldn't want to see that sort of thing starting here because the general public gen, generally, not always, but generally have a pretty good ear for bullshit. They have a pretty good ear for when a politician is telling a lie. And it is that the networks can comment on the, uh, the, the commentators can comment on a speech after it's been made or a press conference after it's finished. But to actually stop people from actually being able to see it, I think is incredibly dangerous. And it kind of feeds into Donald Trump's narrative. And I, I don't believe that Twitter should be censoring Trump's tweets either, that they don't do it to President Xi. So why would they do it to Donald Trump? It's again, that the so-called, and this is what Trump would say, so-called media elites uh, trying to influence people in a way that I think is fundamentally wrong. And I don't have much sympathy with Donald Trump on anything. But on that, uh, I do think that there is a point. Yeah, I really do agree with that. And it's clear that... We're agreeing on everything. This is the, We need to have a fight. <laughs> well, no, I'm a bit more cynical. Uh, not cynical, but I... There were a couple of things on uh, on lockdown where it's not like I disagree, but it's just... Are you too polite to say so? <laughs> no, it's not that I'm too polite to say so. It's just I honestly don't know. I'm just so kind of depressed and fed up that I just don't know what to believe. Well, look, you, you are not alone. Most people, yeah. I think, are probably in that situation. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's not go back to that. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Because it was, this is, is, is a very important point because why wouldn't the media cover it in the sense that if Trump's claims are so stupid... Um, Surely he's just going to make a total fool of himself if you put him on on camera like that, or, or or his press secretary. If they if these claims are just ridiculous, um, it's in a way it's making them look more credible by saying no, 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 you can't see that, guys, and like writing something underneath every tweet. And well, I think point about president. I mean, to did, play devil's well. advocate, I I think their argument would be that they are trying not to take part in the so-called culture war that Trump is promulgating, that, uh, that they, they know what his game is. His game is to cause division, to sow doubt in the electorate's mind about the validity of the result, and they're not going to play ball. Well, that, that might be a reasonable argument to have. I still think it's the wrong one. I think, I think people deserve to know what their president is saying, even if it is absolutely mad. Yeah, because it... If it is as bad as as it as it's meant to be, it will damage his legacy by showing this. Um, so and yeah, but why do you think Twitter aren't kind of applying the same rule to to other presidents and other and other world leaders? Is it just because they're more focused well, because, on the American election? No, because like most media organisations, and that's what Twitter effectively is, they are run by people who would describe themselves in American terms as liberals. Here we would describe them as the liberal left. Um, it, it's an absolute fallacy that the, that the media in this country or in America is right wing. It, it, most media executives 
are not conservatives, either with a big C or a small C. I, th I think, therefore, it's not surprising that they hold these views. I think what's more surprising is that they feel that they are going to gain widespread support from people across the political spectrum for censorship, the very the kind of thing that we criticise the Chinese Communist Party for. And look at what's going on in Hong Kong today, for example. Um, I mean, it just beggars belief that this isn't being called out right around the world. But because our trade relationships with China are so important, um, that, that people just sort of give almost give them a free pass on it. Uh, and if, if you call out the Chinese government or other dictatorial regimes for what they do, um, you, you are then seen as some sort of right wing extremist. Um, I, I just you either believe in free speech or you don't. And I'm afraid, given that Twitter is supposedly a platform for free speech, as is Facebook, I'm afraid they have not covered themselves in glory with glory over the past uh, few months. Yeah, it's it's pretty sad to sad to see um, this type of partisan stuff in, in the media. Um, do you think it extends to some of the commentary in, in a way like there are sometimes when I sometimes I read an article um, and and it is kind of almost like an op ed. And then I look up yeah. at the top and it doesn't say like opinion piece. It's like it's meant to be news reporting. But I, the, I remember the days when news reporting was like almost a bit boring. It was just like and this is then what happened. And then and then you'd get the op ed where it would be. Yeah more incendiary has it all sort of descended into right this is our view as a paper this is our view as a blog our view as a show and we're just hammering it um home i think you've hit on a really important <laughs> point there um you're right if you looked at newspaper front pages not just the headlines but the actual articles so traditionally they've always been just straight news reporting and in some countries they still are if you look at German newspapers for example that is still what they generally do but in this country um, and possibly to a lesser extent in America um, there is a blurring of news reporting and opinion now you could say that well that's all very well for you to say that you are guilty of it yourself and you'd be right because if you look at my program on LBC um, I am there to provide opinions, but I do a news hour between seven and eight. Now, I, I would say that that is, I mean, aside, I do make the odd acerbic aside from time to time, but generally that is what it says on the tin. It is a news hour. We report on the news of the day around the world in this country. Um, we have reporters, correspondents. Uh, I interview people involved in a story. I interview politicians. But generally, it's the sort of thing that you would find on the BBC. But then in the following two hours, I, I host phone-ins uh, where I will give an opinion and challenge my uh, listeners to agree or disagree with me, to hopefully disagree, because it's much more interesting that way around. Now, I think you can do that it, as long as you're completely upfront about what you're trying to do. And people know that if there's a breaking news story, for example, a terror incident, I'm going to revert into complete journalistic mode then. I'm not going to offer an opinion on anything. And I know that I've got a very fine line to tread. But I think generally in the written news media, it, it is very different now. And that I don't particularly want to know the political views of the political editor of The Telegraph or The Times, for example. I want them to tell me what's going on. And then I will turn to the comment pages if I want to read some analysis of what's going on. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, Sky News, I think, is verging into this news opinion field a bit too much at the moment. It's less about, well, it is about reporting on the news, most of which they do incredibly well. But some of their reporters and correspondents have become far too opinionated, um, but they're not open about it. Uh, the, the, they ostensibly uh, want you to think that they're not taking part in the story. But anyone who knows the story knows that the angle that they're putting on it is possibly slightly to one, one side or the other. Now, I don't like that particularly. That's not what I want to switch on a news channel for. If they said, well, look, we are going to be liberal remain a central news channel or we are going to be brexit -y, uh, conservative news channel, fair enough. People know where they're coming from. I think it's insidious, though, when, you, when, when they're not upfront about it. Yeah, and it plays into the narrative of people like Trump. And, and so 
you know, I, I, I want to use the last couple of minutes to ask you about, about your music taste, but one final thing. So your book is called Why Can't We All Just Get, get Along? Um, do you think that this um, tendency in the media um, to become increasingly partisan has made it difficult for people to get along and made uh, people more polarized in their views? Because I think the whole, you know, lamestream media kind of Trump thing, like a lot of people who support him and who are cynical about um, where the media stand are doing things like going to different social media platforms and they're going, you know, they're, they're like reading thing like things like Breitbart and stuff. So they're just going to go into their own echo chamber yeah. and leave another echo chamber and make things more polarized. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading your book. And is that one of the factors there? Well, that is one of the main things that I talk about. In the, and this is, in a sense, nothing new. In this country, if you're on the right, you read the Daily Telegraph or the Mail. If you're on the left, you read the Guardian or the Mirror. It's always been like that. But I think it, it is much more insidious in broadcast media. And this is much more so in America than here because we have Ofcom, America doesn't. So if you're on the right, you watch Fox News. If you're not, you watch MSNBC or CNN and never the twain shall meet. There's no sense of nuance. You, you want to have your own opinions validated and you're not particularly interested in hearing rival opinions, which I think is really dangerous for public discourse. Because if you don't even accept that your opponent has the right to a view, and you're not willing to listen to that view, how can you actually marshal your arguments? When I went to Trump's inauguration in January 2017, I was at the Jefferson Memorial at midnight, and there was a group of um, teenagers, 20-somethings from Alabama, all wearing the Make America Great hats. So I said to my producer, let's go and interview them. So we did. And I went from one to the other and said, so how is Donald Trump going to make America great again? And each of them answered, he just is. And you think, well... That's all you've got to answer. You just think that Donald Trump is the second coming and that therefore he's going to make America great again. And I'm afraid we have too much of that in this country where Brexiteers uh, don't even accept the Remainer argument and vice versa, possibly more so vice versa, that Remainers think that Brexiteers are thick, stupid, ignorant racists generally, and that, that how can they possibly vote to leave the EU? Only a mad person would do that without even bothering to engage at all. And I think that's a really sad state of affairs for our public discourse, but I'm not sure that I see it changing massively. Yeah, well, I really hope it does. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's easy to feel a, a little bit depressed about the situation. However, on a more uplifting note, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, this is the greatest music of all time podcast. So what's the music that means the most to you? Is it Cliff, who you interviewed the other day? Um, who are your favourite artists? Well, I have a very eclectic music taste, um, which is a code word for saying terrible music taste. Um, I, I like... I. <sighs> I mean, it is quite varied in that, yes, I do have on my phone 1,936 Cliff Richard songs. I have every single song that ABBA have ever released. Roxette, Sparks, Meatloaf, um, Alphaville, uh, all, all sorts of... I mean, I, I quite like... If I listen to a music station, it's either Radio X or Smooth. I, I, I do like rock music, but I also like sort of fairly mellow music. Um, Miss Unites by Cliff Richard is my number one all-time song. I know it's very schmaltzy, but I just love it. It's one of those songs, I remember the first time I heard it at the age of, what, 12, it just made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And you, you know a song like that when you hear it. It's like, as an artist called Alistair Griffin that you probably have never heard of, he, he wrote and sung Just Drive, the theme for the Formula One uh, program and again that was a similar song it it just it does a, a song does something to you that you just want to hear it over and over and over again um so yeah my i i don't have any sort of weird and wacky musical tastes i'm afraid but um they're fairly sort of traditional rock pop i like synth pop that if i if i had to pick one genre of music to listen to for 24 hours non-stop it would be synth pop alphaville big in japan forever young those are their two biggest hits um pro one of my favorite bands of all time i've never seen them in concert they're still going they're still releasing new stuff They're around since i think 1973 i've seen them in, i've met them once seen them in concert a few times and, and they're still releasing new albums and uh, people like david bowie the pet shop boys not exist had sparks not existed i think one of the most underrated bands of all time
Yeah, I saw them performing. Um, I went to a taping of uh, Late Night with Jules Holland and they were there and that's how I got introduced to them, but they're brilliant. And yeah, I mean, I like a, I love a good Cliff Richard ballad as well. You know, my personal favourite is Ocean Deep. I think that's a, a yeah. that's definitely a, a you know, spine tingling tune. Um, but yeah, no, uh, you're a man of taste, Ian. You know, I've got a very, uh, I've got a very old school, you know, 70s, 80s taste. Even Excellent. though I do interview all types of people um, on the show. Thanks so much for joining me, and I'd encourage all my listeners to check out Ian's book. Like I'm going to, why can't we all just get along? Um, because you know, and I've got a new a new one out this week as well. The Prime Ministers. It looks. Oh, really? To- is that coming out this week? That is out this week. It's because it's the 300th anniversary of the office of Prime Minister in April next year. So I've got that we've had 55 Prime Ministers since 1721. So I've got 55 different people to write about each one. I've written about Boris Johnson. And um, yeah, it comes out, uh, well, tomorrow, actually. So um, great Christmas present book. Hint, hint. <laughs>